Jacques Derrida. Let me say just a few words of introduction um, about Derrida. Um, Derrida was born in 1930 in Algeria. Um, he comes from a Jewish family. He moved to Paris uh, to study and became a very central figure uh, in the world of, of, of Parisian intellectual circles as a professor of philosophy in Paris. Um, he is associated with the world of architecture through two particular, uh, two particular projects. One, his collaboration with Peter Reisman, which we'll be hearing more about uh, later in the Parc de la Villette uh, in Paris, and also because he is the person who coined the term deconstruction that has been associated somewhat problematically in some cases with an architectural style. Broadly speaking, and I'll mention deconstruction in more detail uh, in a moment, but broadly speaking, deconstruction in philosophy is a project which seeks to expose the paradoxes and value-laden hierarchies that exist within the discourse of Western metaphysics. In opposition to structuralism, it stresses the deferral, the play and slippage of meaning that is always at work in the process of signification. And although it dismantles concepts, deconstructions linked with architecture are clearly only metaphorical. Nonetheless, I believe that the term can be used in a very productive way to interrogate the ideas and the thinking behind architecture rather than necessarily the forms themselves. We're also going to be um, mentioning uh, Helen Sixou. Helen Sixou it cannot, it, it comes from a very so similar background to Derrida. Um, she also comes from Algeria. She also comes, has a, 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 is also from a Jewish family. She also moved to Paris and she also became a professor in Paris. She was born in 1937, that's seven years after Derrida, and she's, uh, she's still, still, still working. Uh, Sixou is a, a versatile French writer and critic who has worked in a variety of areas, fiction, theatre and theoretical writing in a, style, uh, in, in a style frequently transgressive of genre. She's associated with a group of thinkers who are um, sort of psychoanalytic thinkers. She's also associated with uh, two other leading feminists from, from uh, uh, France at that time, uh, Lucia Rigare and uh, Yulia Kresteva. Um, her work has been informed by the very strong psychoanalytic impulse which seeks to challenge unconscious structures of exclusion. Uh, Sixer was argued that, that instead for a sexual difference based on openness to the other and has promoted uh, écriture féminine or feminine writing as a strategy of exploring difference in a non-exclusionary way. But such writing is not limited to, to, to women. Uh, also included in this, in this genre is uh, the work of uh, James Joyce. She's not been so closely involved in architecture as such, um, although she was a supervisor of Doina Petrescu, um, uh, but she has contributed um, a, very, a very interesting article about Prague, her ancestral home, her ancestral city, that was reprinted, that was printed in Rethinking Architecture and also Architecture and Revolution. It's an essay uh, basically about Prague. Um, and like much of her other writing, this essay called Attacks of the Castle contains traces of autobiographical material and a significant psychoanalytic dimension. It draws in particular on an earlier work of, uh, of, of, by Kafka, Before the Law, which had been used by Sixu as an allegory for female exclusion under patriarchy. In, Ka in Kafka's story, a man arrives before the door to the law, but remains convinced of his own exclusion, even though the door remains open. The theme of access and denial runs throughout this essay on Prague, Attacks of the Castle. Prague is a city that can never be fully captured by the ontohermeneutical process. It is not Prague, but Prague's, promised Prague's, to which the author, like the character in Kafka's tale, would never gain entry. As she writes, promised Prague's, you dream of going, you cannot go, what would happen if you went? The theme of Prague as a city of multiple interpretation echoes Sixer's earlier observations on Monet's 26 paintings, each of which was an attempt to capture Rouen Cathedral. The truth of Rouen Cathedral doesn't lie in any one of these, but in all 26 of these interpretations. And it is in her own very painterly and self-reflexive way of writing, on, writing about Prague, a Prague of traces, memories, and meanings erased by repetition, that Sixou opens up the possibility of a new way of writing about the city. I want to uh, address three things uh, in this presentation in terms of um, Derrida's thinking. I, I first want to address the question about whether or not we can uh, uh, see Derrida as a relativist, as has been claimed by some people. Then I want to look at the uh, try and look more precisely at the, the question of deconstruction. And then finally, I want to look at 
his engagement with architecture and his interface um, with, uh, with 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 um, uh, with architects. And I will uh, then be playing uh, a, a, a short piece that uh, um, that uh, we prepared by Bernard Shumi before handing over to the others. So the idea that there's always a kind of play of meaning and there are mental, uh, multiple interpretations that can be made about any particular text has opened Derrida to the, to, to the charge of being a relativist. Was he a relativist? I want to argue precisely the opposite. I want to argue precisely the opposite by reference to some comments that he makes in his book, The Truth in Painting, in terms of uh, a particular comment by Martin Heidegger um, and his reference to, to uh, some pair of shoes, um, uh, a painting by, by Van Gogh. Um, Heidegger, I should say, I, I once heard Derrida give a lecture where he commented that, I, that he had uh, he had been trained in Heideggerian thinking, and his whole project was to overcome Heideggerian thinking. And so I want to just kind of tease out that difference between, between him and this kind of hermeneutical tradition of phenomenology that, to which we could probably we could uh, uh, locate uh, Heidegger. What interests Derrida about these particular shoes is the way that Heidegger appropriates them, as it were. Heidegger writes about these particular shoes within the framework of his discourse about the countryside, about the soil, all this very Heideggerian thinking. For Heidegger, these are the shoes of Van Gogh that he wore in the countryside. They speak of the soil, they speak of this approach that, that Heidegger had towards the country. Now, what was interesting for Derrida was that the New York art critic, Maya Shapiro, who is of course very different to, to, to Heidegger, he lives in a city, he is Jewish, whereas Heidegger has, has, was, is known for his anti-Semitic comments, and Shapiro takes the opposite view. He argues that saying to say that these are these are not the shoes of someone in the countryside. These are the shoes of someone tramping through the city. There are shoes that are worn by Van Gogh when he was in the city. Now Derrida's point is basically that both are guilty of a form of appropriation of trying to claim the shoes as part of their particular project. And he asks the question: On what basis can you make this particular statement? And I think that's the important point here, is that say, rather than seeing that De Derrida is a relativist by saying that anything can mean anything, Derrida is always very careful and precise to question the, the basis of any particular subject, to problematize it, to call into question everything that has been stated. Um, and that, to my mind, is lies at the heart of his, his, his inquiry, that he's really asking, interrogating the text and asking questions. And for him, really, theory is a form of problematization, a form of questioning things. There's often no way out of the problem, but at least if you're aware of a problem as being a problem, it becomes a different kind of problem, one with which you can begin to deal. Now, what I would stress here, therefore, there's a difference between this, let's say, Heideggerian approach, which, as it were, collapses the subject into the object as though you are one with culture and you can discern and understand and divine the secrets of culture and the kind of post-structuralist approach, which is always questioning the way in which we relate to things and, and, and asking that question on what basis can we say anything about anything else. So to my mind, far from being a relativist, one could perhaps accuse that hermeneutical tradition of being um, the more relativistic. Now, turning to the question of deconstruction, um, what does Derrida mean by deconstruction? Let me point out, first of all, stress that is simply an architectural metaphor. He's not talking about form in any way. Architects tend to read form into every civil term when they see it and to think that these, that these are references to architectural form, but they're not. He's asked, he's basically looking at the way in which culture has been constructed. Now, what, what, does he, what do we mean by culture being constructed? The idea is basically that we are being, to some extent, we are being, um, uh, uh, we are being conditioned by our culture, uh, in some senses brainwashed, to think in a certain sort of way. Now, I'm showing you here um, a, a picture of, of a rainbow, in fact, two rainbows. And if you think about the concept of the rainbow, what is interesting, if you, is it, if you were to ask anybody from any school kid from any country in the world how many colors there are in a rainbow, they would all say seven. Red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet. But the point is that there are an infinite number of colors in the rainbow. Um, and it's the fact that we've been conditioned to think that there are seven colors shows how culture is, has been constructed. And of course, this applies to architecture too. Our understanding of architecture has been constructed. Uh, for example, the term uh, functionalism, we would often imagine uh, from our architectural training that functionalism probably refers to a building with Pilotti and a flat roof. 
anybody who's lived in the UK, as Peter has when he was studying at Cambridge, or as Doina has in teaching at the University of Sheffield, will know that, that it rains a lot in the UK, and there's a flat roof certainly is not functional. So for Derrida, the idea of deconstruction is not about uh, demolishing anything to do with form, it's about challenging those constructed understandings of how we understand the world and removing those biases, we could see it in some senses, the privileged hierarchies, the way in which we would tend to privilege one um, term in a binary opposition over another, male over female, practice over theory, and so on, and to dismantle those things, to, to remove them. So in a sense, it is an architectural metaphor. It's a metaphor in the sense that, that we want to, he wants to get to the point where he can build a solid foundation, to build from a solid foundation, trying to get beyond all those um, uh, 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 constructive understandings of the world. Of course, we will never escape, but as I say, it's a question of being aware that they are there in the first place. The term deconstruction, of course, has been used and abused by many people since. Um, Derrida was very precise how he used the term. It was not a method, it was a kind of in in inquiry in some senses, and yet the term has been used in many different ways. It's been used broadly to refer to um, interpretation, to critique, and so on um, in general now. Uh, this was a movie, one of the last movies that Derrida saw before he died. Um, and he was deeply disturbed by the way in which the term deconstruction was now being used. Um, I think by now he'd be turning in his grave if he were to hear some of the ways in which it's been used. I once heard the, the, the Olympic uh, triple jump uh, commentator, the hop, skip and jump, referring to a jump and saying, let's deconstruct this jump. <laughs> but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that, la that language itself is dynamic and you can't simply correct it. You can't go back to etymological uh, origins of things. Um, uh, and, and as, 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 uh, as Wittgenstein would say, the meaning of a word is how it's been used. And clearly there is a different way in which the term deconstruction um, is used today. So let's just um, pick up on uh, how on the relationship between Derrida's work and the world of architecture, which is extremely problematic, but intriguing in many ways. Um, let's go back to 1988 to two important moments um, in the history of, of of architecture um, and the history of, of theoretical discourse in architecture. On the one hand, we had a, an amazing event going on in New York, uh, curated by Philip Johnson and Mark Wigley, Deconstructive, Deconstructive His Architecture, an exhibition at the um, at, at MoMA, Museum of Modern Art in New York, and this is the, ca the cover of the catalogue. On the other hand, we had an event going on in London at the, the Tate, the earlier Tate, not the Tate Modern, where there was a debate about philosophy and art, um, where they were trying to connect Derrida's work with new forms of visual expression. Um, and, and this came out as a, um, as a book uh, published by Rizzoli <coughs> with Andreas Papadakis, Catherine Cook, who was a constructivist, who was a Russian um, a historian of Russian constructivism, and Andrew Benjamin, um, the philosopher. And I, I suppose the title of deconstructivist the architecture could be seen to be a play on that. On the one hand, you had this uh, extraordinary, astonishing work that was being reassessed within progressive circles. People like Rem Kohlhaas were interrogating the Russian constructivists. And of course, through that, because Zaha was a student of Rem's, so was Zaha and so on. It was a very interesting moment. So Russian constructivism was kind of, in some senses, paired up with the world of deconstruction as a way of kind of challenging pre-existing ways of thinking. The architects who were involved in this are all well-known figures, uh, three of them, uh, Pritzker Prize winners, I think three, um, uh, Bernard Schumi, top left, um, uh, Wolf Pricks here, Rem Kohlhaas and below him, Daniel Lieberskin, Frank Gehry, uh, Zaha, and of course, Peter himself. But it's important to note that in those days, relatively few buildings had been um, built by these individuals. Um, uh, this was back 1988, and it was probably not until 1997 when uh, Gehry's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao was constructed, at least in terms of what Zaha has told me, um, that that's when, when, when the commission started, that suddenly everyone began to realize that this new critical and progressive way of approaching architecture could actually deliver some amazing architecture. Um, so these were very, back in 88, they were still very much in their infancy, but of course, all of these figures have become very significant architects since then. I want to just refer to one particular project, which, um, uh, which I want to 
relate to what Derrida himself has written. Um, now, I'm not going to say much about this. It's a well-known project, uh, the project that uh, the, 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 the project that uh, Bernard Shumi, um, uh, he won the competition uh, with, with Rem Kohlhaas II for the Parc de la Villette in Paris. Um, and we all know about this as a kind of grid of these uh, red uh, cubes, distorted, twisted uh, cubes um, in the landscape. Peter, of course, was involved in uh, the landscaping itself in his collaboration with Derrida. Um, and these, these cubes were intended to, in Bernard's um, terms to be a form of, forms of event spaces where unpredictable events would happen. Um, and they were trying to, 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 see, to see architect not as a hierarchy, but a distributed uh, network or grid of these particular cubes. Now, to my mind, what makes this project interesting over and beyond uh, the project itself was the fact that Derrida wrote a, a really a, a very interesting piece about this particular project. Um, uh, and uh, uh, let me just kind of refer to this. Uh, there are, in Rethinking Architects, there are, th there are three articles, uh, three pieces. One um, about Peter himself, <clears throat> why Peter Eisman writes such good books. Another one, uh, an interview, uh, Architecture Where the Desire May Live. And this particular article, which I find extremely illuminating, I think it's one of his best, his best ever pieces of writing. But uh, as as um, as many of you will will um, uh, uh, will know, Derrida was both either um, uh, infuriating in the way that would express itself, or delightfully kind of enigmatic. Um, a lot of the writing uh, depends on a kind of a wordplay, um, what the French would call double entendre, double meaning. And in the very title of the piece, we can see a number of kind of uh, games going on. The first point. Point de folie, of course, these are one, uh, both the, the points on a, on a grid, as it were, these follies, but also point de means what is the point of, what is the, what is the meaning of, um, it's a play on that particular term. Meanwhile, maintenant l'architecture is, we all know, is maintenant means now in French, but also it means maintaining. And really for Derrida, the idea of these, these uh, red cubes is that they should be seen as like dice that were being thrown in order to to give architecture a chance to 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 allow it to break free free from the kind of constraints in under which it had been that had been imposed on it, and importantly also this comment here. Let us not forget that there is an architecture of architecture, and this is the vital point that he's making here. There is an architecture of architecture by which he means we have a constructed way of how we approach architecture. There is a construction of construction, an architecture of architecture. And what this piece is trying to argue is, 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 that, um, is that, that these, these, this particular project is challenging that. It is deconstructing the semantics of what architecture is all about. And in many ways, you could see this as a, a reading of Derrida's whole philosophy into this particular um, project. Um, so he talks about how these uh, four constraints that are imposed on architecture need to be called into question. Briefly speaking, without going into any detail, they refer to the notion of dwelling, to tradition, to function and beauty. And what he's pointing out is that these follies challenge this. They put into, into operation a general dislocation. They draw into it everything that until Manton, until now, seems to have given architecture meaning, more precisely everything that seems to have given architecture over to meaning. They deconstruct, first of all, but not only the semantics of architecture. And just to repeat, that is the point about deconstruction. It's really challenging, questioning, not the forms, but the thinking, the ideas behind the forms themselves. The, the, uh, what is the meaning of architecture itself? These follies destabilize meaning, the meaning of meaning, the signifying ensemble of this powerful architect, uh, the powerful architectonics, those four points that I mentioned. They put into question, dislocate, dislocate, destabilize or deconstruct the edifice of this configuration. Again, it's not about buildings, but the, the ideas, the constraints, the constructed way in which we understand architecture. They do battle with the very meaning of architectural meaning as it has been bequeathed to us and as we still inhabit it. Do they not lead back to the desert of an architecture as, as a zero degree of architectural writing, a prose made of abstract, neutral, inhuman, useless, uninhabitable and meaningless volumes? Precisely not. And this is the point. It's basically by breaking free of these constraints that these follies, as it were, 
keep architecture alive. They give architecture a chance as these little dice, as it were. The follies affirm and engage their affirmation beyond, beyond this ultimately annihilating, secretly nihilistic repetition of metaphysical architecture. They enter into the mantle of the maintaining, the, the now, the maintaining of architecture, which I speak. They maintain, renew, and reinscribe architecture. They revive, perhaps, an energy which was infinitely anesthetized, walled in, and buried in a common grave or sepulchral nostalgia. The way I interpret that maybe is about the about postmodernism, the way in which we could sort of see also as deconstruction challenging the more conservative uh, way of approaching things. Of uh, uh, In many ways, Bernard Schumi talks about himself in terms of deconstruction rather than reconstruction and contrasting himself with the work of more conservative historians such as uh, Vincent Scully. <clears throat> Neither architecture nor an architecture, trans architecture. Now it seems to me that this is this this is it, it's it's a difficult piece to begin with, but it's very clear what it's saying. It's basically arguing that we need to keep architecture alive by challenging the way in which we've seen things, by di dismantling the kind of concepts that have that have basically been imposed on it, and opening up to other forms of discourse in a very radical way. Um, <clears throat> what I find interesting about this is is really how it kind of fits into a kind of discourse that goes back to the work of Foucault and others in May 68 of challenging the disciplines, of challenging everything in many ways, um, and, and in challenging in particular the world of architecture here. <clears throat> 